Okay, so a very beautiful morning to all. So on behalf of the director of NIAB, it gives me immense pleasure to extend the heartiest welcome to our chief guest today, Professor Patho Pratin Majundar to NIAB. A warm, warm welcome to all the members of NIAB family all other distinguished attendees in the auditorium and all the participants on the virtual platform to Dr. Lalji Singh Memorial Lecture. And this is the third lecture in the series conducted by NIAB in the honor of Dr. Lalji Singh. We reached out to uh, Dr. Lalji Singh's family member as well. Uh, due to uh, other appointments, they could not join in, but they uh, offered their thanks to NIAB family. Dr. Lalji Singh, fondly called as the father of Indian DNA fingerprinting, was an outstanding personality, an excellent scientist, an able administrator, an institution builder, and a social worker all rolled into one persona. He was one of the leading scientists in taking DNA fingerprinting to the mainstream in India, both in terms of basic research as you allege, for forensic applications. Enthused by his work, the government of India entrusted him with the task of establishing a center for DNA fingerprinting and diagnostics. We all know CDFD at Hyderabad in the late 90s, which has since grown into a major institution with global standing. He was also known for his path-breaking research work on Indian population, especially that were conducted on the tribes of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The study found that the tribes were perhaps the first descendants of the people who moved out of Africa to India about 60,000 to 70,000 years ago and proposed the theory of southern coastal route of migration via India. Dr. Singh founded various institutes and laboratories in India, including CDFD in 1995, Laboratory for Conservation of endangered species known as lacones in 1998, and Genome Foundation in 2004. Uh, he served as the Vice Chancellor of uh, Bangalore Hindu University, BHU, and Chairman of Board of Governors of IIT, BHU. He also served as Director of CCMB, Hyderabad, also as Officer on Special Duty of CDFD, Hyderabad. He was a member of all, all of the science academies in India, and he was also recipient of Padma Sri in recognition of his contribution to Indian science and technology. And NIAB was privileged to have him as our first scientific advisory committee chairman as well. So now I will request our director and professor uh, Majumdar. Uh, to come to Dias and offer tribute to uh, uh, Dr. Alji Singh. And I would also request everybody to stand and mourn for a minute in the honor of and with respect of Professor Alji Thank you all. Uh, now I'll request our director to uh, give a few words. Okay. 
Thank you, Dr. Baba Dike. Very good morning to one and all. Very respected Dr. Parthati Majumdar. It is indeed an honor to have you here for such an important memorial lecture. The details as has been shared by my colleague Dr. Bapadite about it. Having Dr. Parthu Majumdar here with the title which he says, I don't know from where to start about him. That uh, I think Dr. Bapadite would do uh, in a structured introduction about the speaker. But uh, just to talk to Professor Majumdar and to think and rethink and sometimes get amazed and get motivated as well. A strong, robust, skeletal knowledge of statistics, which Professor Majumdar has used to, to the research related to human genetics. And if I just touch the tip, of an iceberg and say, I was talking to him, how did it occur to you to make an IBNG what it is today? And the way he was talking about it, and it is the issue of the country. And I'm very happy, and we are indeed, uh, we draw pride in it that we are associated not only with an, an IBMG, but also with you, sir. While the previous director and the team led by him was working on livestock genomics. With this small thing, I on my own behalf and on behalf of everybody else with a sense of respect and warm affection, to put a word of thanks to you and welcome you. And uh, it would be very nice if I can request Dr. Subir, who is associated with Professor Majunda for long, to please come and speak a couple of words uh, for Dr. Majunda. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone, and uh, and <laughs> I I will be very informal, not formal, because uh, I will just I I think Bapadita has, as Madam said, structured way. He might have taken it from somewhere, and uh, I would say the informal thing about him and how you should drive inspiration from him. So we have been seeing him, I was a biologist, obviously I am a biologist and sir is basically a master blaster of statistics in India and I was working in a very big institute of India, very prestigious. So we always thought that he belongs to other subjects, he belongs to other subjects and all of us know for us biologists, statistics is a kind of thing very difficult to even understand <laughs> or get about practicing it at that level. But I have seen that how he picked up the biology, the need of statistics in biology up to the highest level in the country. And I have seen that that merger in his mind whereby he dared to start such a big institution, which is a human biology based institution, perforated from all places with the uh, with the good work of Jai Hindi, but Tir get there, na. So Tir se pura beda hua hai statistics ke. So itna sundar ek institute tayar hua hai. Such a nice institute has been made, and we all basically all institutes of India 
should go there and see the kind of facilities are available, the kind of institutes are available, the kind of people he has brought there, and the way they work. And there is a wonderful relationship between the people who are working there. We have gone there for our lives of you know, this uh, project. And our Indigo chip, which has come out of it, it is only because of such guidance from the beginning. Even before writing the grant, he was the chairperson for that committee, which really guided us what to do, what not to do. And every six months, uh, we would be meeting with him and he would guide us with great, great inputs, which we are not capable of even thinking, which has helped us to bring out Indigo chip from, chip from this institute. So this institute is grateful and thankful to him for helping us and guiding us to go there. Now coming to him as a person, I wish all of you become like him, extraordinarily straightforward person. And I was telling Madam that we are very fearful to go in front of him because if we do anything wrong, he is going to say straightforward to you without wasting time of yours and his. The meaningful thing for the science needs to be done. That is what is the principle. And that's why he has done so much uh, uh, contribution to the not only genetics and genomics, but several subjects he now masters and is in various committees. And most prestigiously, he is uh, the, the president of Indian Academy of Science. Such a big honor to have him amongst us. And I still remember that if there are some fellows, Dr. Devi Prasad Sarkar, sir, he has made a commitment to himself. Anybody who becomes fellow of uh, INSA or Indian Academy of Science or NASI, he takes them to their his village. And he counts how many fellows I have brought to the village. See, imagine those who understand the value of that. Sir is president of all of them. And uh, it was very nice to work with him. It was very nice to increase my boldness to speak outright, upfront, because of the association with him and his success. And what relationship remains the same. And uh, it is only for science that we should be very open. We should be very clear cut. That's the biggest lesson I have taken from him, with or without his knowledge, I don't know. But we are really, really thankful to him that he could give us some time for us. And uh, if you go and just uh, scroll through the internet, nowadays it is very, very easy to do that. You will find what great uh, scientist he is and uh, where he stands in India today. He's really, really a very respectable person. And I thank you, sir, for taking your time and joining us. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sumit sir's informal words actually saying it all. Uh, for me, again, speaking about Professor Mojumdar will be uh, kind of talking big words in my small mouth. You know? uh, however, for those who uh, did not know uh, the journey of Professor Mojumdar and how his journey actually inspired us, I'll still speak a couple of structure words. So, um, Yes, so on this novel occasion today, we have our distinguished guest, Professor uh, Parthaprati Majumdar, who made inordinate contribution to the field of statistics, population genetics, and genomics. Today, we are going to witness an ardent genomic scientist talk in the memory of another genome scientist. And both represent those early geneticists who recognized the importance of studying genetic structure of ethnic population using molecular genetic tools to discover genes conferring susceptibilities to various common diseases. And they also work together in a number of common genetic and genomic projects of national importance. So it is almost like today we are going to see in Bangla, it says like Ganga Jola Ganga Puja. Sir will uh, uh, understand this very well. And uh, Professor Majumdar, also known as Gene Guru, in the social media, across social as well as scientific media. One of his major interests is the human evolution. And he has worked extensively to uncover genetic architecture behind disease susceptibility and drug responses. And another part of his passionate and brilliant genius is researching statistical application and developing algorithms. He has devised innovative paradigms and statistical methods 
for solving biological problems related to modes of inheritance of complex human traits and mapping genes underlying such traits. And as uh, Shubhish sir told, his advice for our very own cattle genomics project, project is invaluable. So uh, Professor Mojunda received all his ac academic degrees from Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata. He did his postdoctoral work at the Center for Demographics and Population Genetics, University of Texas, Health Science Center, Houston, USA. He returned to India and joined the faculty of his alma mater, ISI Kolkata again and where he later became a professor and headed a number of special center of advanced research on statistics and genetics. He was also the founding director of NIVMG, Kalyan US Bengal, which is again a DBT institute. From its inception from 2009, uh, he was the director till 2016, and now he's the distinguished professor there. Uh, Professor Patu Mujundar is a founding member of the International Genetic Epidemiology Society and was the founding chair of its ethical, legal, and social issue committee. He has served on committees of the UNESCO for drafting guidelines and declarations pertaining to the human genome and human genetics. He has been honored with numerous fellowships and awards, including Ranbaxi Research Award, New Millennium Science Medal, GD Birla Award for Scientific Research, he is also a fellow of the Indian Academy of Science, Bangalore, and National Academy of Sciences, India, Allahabad. And he's cur currently serving as the president of Indian Academy of Sciences as well. So now I request Professor Partho Majumdar sir to enlighten us with each today's lecture on tracing some developments on human genetics in India. Sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's indeed it's indeed an honor for uh, me to be called upon uh, to deliver this memorial lecture. Um, it's it's very hard for me to actually convince myself that I should be. Uh, giving the Lalji Singh Memorial Lecture, uh, primarily because he and I were on first name terms. He was a little senior to me, but we were on first name terms from day one almost. I uh, can't recall exactly when I met him, but it may have been 1989 uh, after I returned from the US, it may have been 1990. Uh, but it's, uh, and from that time till he passed away under extraordinary circumstances. Uh, we were friends, uh, and uh, not just friends, but uh, also uh, deep collaborators. Whether or not we wrote papers together is immaterial, but we uh, address the same kinds of problems, and I'll give you some glimpses of that, and uh, try to uh, you know, uh, reach out and draw inferences that are uh, generalizable in various uh, domains. Again, I'll give you a glimpse of that. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, uh, Professor Sharma for asking me to give this talk and to Professor Mazumdar for reaching out to me to uh, deliver this talk. And uh, I'm grateful to all of you for coming to this memorial lecture. Indeed, like I said, that it is very, very uh, hard for me to give this talk primarily because you don't, you don't give a memorial lecture for a great friend of yours. It becomes very difficult, emotionally very challenging to give such a talk. Nevertheless, I've accepted the task and therefore I should try and uh, do the best that I can. Uh, again, this is in memory of my friend, uh, Professor Lalji Singh. You have heard that uh, Professor Lalji Singh was of course, uh, you know, uh, father of DNA fingerprinting, but more importantly, he was a fantastic administrator and a fantastic scientist. And again, like I said, that I will give you glimpses of that. Many of you are actually may already be knowing some of the work, some of his contributions to science. Um, he uh, initially, he was, his background was in zoology, but uh, slowly he graduated himself to genetics and then to genomics uh, and so on and so forth. So he, he sort of unfolded the various kinds of um, intrinsic 
um, intrinsic properties or intrinsic, um, uh, you know, the, the scientific passion that he had that unfolded over a period of time. Uh, he also started working on various aspects of human genetics, including human population structure and, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, human diseases. And that's where we have a congruence uh, in, of interest. So I've titled this talk as uh, Tracing Some Developments of Human Genetics in India. And I'll really start at the beginning. The only person who I will not touch is Didi Kosambi. Uh, his name is also etched in the Annals of Genetics. Um, Didi Kosambi was primarily a historian, um, uh, an announced Marxist, uh, a social reformer. And he made one seminal contribution to genetics. Uh, well, actually, I'm lying. It's not just one seminal contribution, but a series of contributions, not too many, but one seminal contribution to genetics that carries his name. It's called the Kosambi's mapping function. It's really trying to find uh, the physical or trying to estimate the physical distance between uh, two genes, uh, not based on physical measurement, but by uh, trying to estimate that physical distance by the combination event. So that's called a mapping function. There are multiple mapping functions, and D.D. Kosambi's mapping function was one of the earliest. It's not specific to humans. It's, it can be used for any other uh, animal species as well. So that's, I'm not going to touch upon uh, D.D. Kosambi, but if I talk about uh, the development of human genetics in India, um, by the way, I, let me also make one statement that Mendel's laws, as we all know, were discovered, rediscovered in 1900. This 20th of July is the 200th birth anniversary of Mendel, Gregor Mendel. Um, after he, uh, his laws were discovered by the three people, uh, the three Scorans and Shermak, uh, he, um, human geneticists were the first people who actually found out that human diseases, are also, uh, human diseases also follow Mendel's laws. And that was in 1902, two years after Mendel's laws were discovered, and this pertains to a disease called alcaxinuria, uh, which is where you have, you know, a dark sweat and all kinds of, it's a, it's a plethora of problems that you have. Uh, it's, it's really an enzyme problem, but uh, uh, not correctable, it's a genetic problem. It's called alcaxinuria. So um, human genetics uh, was actually born, or human biomedical genetics was actually born uh, all two years after the rediscovery of Mendel's laws. That's not when human genetics was born in India, and human genetics in India was not born out of disease genetics. It was born out of uh, more anthropological considerations. Uh, it was born out of the, uh, the curiosity uh, of the diversity of people that we see in uh, India, and uh, the nature of diversity of humans in India is very large. They also congregate in different social groups. And these social groups also um, you know, have very different genetic structures, and that's where it came from. Of course, uh, genetics didn't start then. Uh, people, we didn't even have the tools and the technologies of studying genetic constitution of people. Uh, the kind of tools that we had to understand this diversity were measurements. So it all started with measurements, and then the person who actually started these kinds of measurements, etc., cetera, uh, became uh, disenchanted that, uh, you know, deep uh, insights were not being derived primarily because um, these physical measurements like height, weight, etc., are impacted on by environment to a large extent. So he was trying to understand the innate biological differences between these diverse population groups that there, that there are in India. Uh, unfortunately, tools were not available and therefore uh, the man became very um, disgruntled and disenchanted. Um, I will talk about him uh, in a minute because, after all, like I said, that it was populations and population genetics that started human genetics in India. But before I do that, let me pay my tribute to the three founding fathers of population genetics. The three founding fathers were these three people, the trio, Ronald Fisher, J.B.S. Haldane, and Sewell Wright. Ronald Fisher came to India seven times and he helped uh, uh, P.C. Malanobis, who set up the Indian Statistical Institute, guided and helped him set up the Indian Statistical Institute. J.B.S. Haldane uh, renounced his British citizenship, again a Marxist, 
renounced his British uh, citizenship on a flimsy reason because of uh, the fact that Britain attacked the Suez Canal and so on and so forth. So anyway, that, that's a big story by itself. Uh, he renounced his British uh, citizenship, uh, took up the Indian citizenship, came and joined as a member of the Indian uh, faculty of the Indian Statistical Institute. And the third person is Sewell Wright, who was initially at the University of Chicago, uh, and then moved to the University of Wisconsin, Madison. All three of them together uh, embody the, the, the literature that we know um, uh, on population genetics. They, provide, they have provided models, they have provided systematization of um, uh, genetic thought in terms of understanding diversity of populations, etc. Uh, and, and these populations, for example, um, uh, Sewell Wright, for a long period of time, actually didn't work on humans. Uh, unlike unlike uh, Ronald Fisher and uh, G.B. Haldane, Sewell Wright actually worked with various other kinds of animals. Um, so anyway, uh, Sewell Wright, as far as I know, did not visit India, but th this is the trio that actually founded uh, population genetics. The uh, person, uh, one of the founders, uh, Ronald Fisher, one of the founders of population genetics, was also the father of modern statistical science. Ronald Fisher was also the father of modern statistical science. Uh, and uh, of course, the father of modern statistical science in India uh, was Prashant Chandramala Nobis. He set up the uh, Indian Statistical Institute. And um, uh, Ronald Fisher guided and uh, provided a great uh, lots of help to Malo Nobis in setting up the Indian Statistical Institute. He is the one who, um, goaded by an anthropologist, and I'll tell you his name in a minute, uh, goaded by an anthropologist, he was the first person who asked uh, proper uh, questions or systematic questions about the diversity of human population groups in India and went about uh, trying to find out how these things may have arisen and got disenchanted because he was not getting the kind of answers that he was looking for. Uh, it didn't really have the biological spirit in it, primarily because of the impact of a large amount of environmental factors. Uh, this is, you'll find that there are three names here. P.C. Malanobis is the first name. The second name is D.N. Majumdar. D.N. Majumdar is actually the anthropologist who asked Malanobis, uh, uh, can we find out which groups are more similar to each other in the midst of all of this diversity that we see among population groups of India? Uh, and C.R. Rao, the statistician, who was uh, a student of Malanobis, young at that point of time, this is a, a late 19. 30s, uh, early 1940s. The paper was published in 1941. The survey was conducted beginning 1938. It took about three years to conduct the survey. The survey was conducted in the United Provinces. Uh, this is like uh, Uttarakhand, uh, UP, uh, that, that whole region. Uh, the states have been reconstituted or re, uh, boundaries have been uh, relayed of various states in India, but that was the United Provinces in 1941. So they chose a large number of groups from that large region called the United Provinces and tried to find out what may be the relationships among these groups, physical relationships. And uh, in order to understand the physical relationships, physical meaning biological relationships, in order to do that, they, they, uh, they resorted to anthropometric uh, measurements. So they uh, measured you know, height, weight, uh, skin fold thicknesses, uh, arm length, uh, leg length, and so on and so forth, a large number of um, measurements were taken on each individual, um, drawn from various population groups living in United Provinces. And then they uh, came up with some measure of distance. As a matter of fact, uh, many of you would have heard about Malonobis d squared, which is really a measure of distance between two groups based on uh, measurements, based on quantitative measurements. And it carries its name. It's called Malonobis d squared. D squared. It arose from this particular survey. Uh, um, when he was thinking about how to uh, um, how to quantify the distance between two population groups, each population group being represented by a sample of individuals, each individual being characterized by a number of measurements. So from there, those kinds of thoughts led to this metric called Malanobis d squared. Uh, so anyhow, uh, they conducted the study and uh, they uh, provided a, a very long report, like 200 page report on this particular survey. Uh, and then they went on to uh, do another survey, which was in Bengal, that was undivided Bengal at that time, West Bengal and East Bengal combined, undivided Bengal. And uh, uh, that study was also done in a very similar way. 
the both of these studies ask the same kinds of questions are the uh, population groups uh, belonging to the same social hierarchy are they more close biologically are the population groups who are um, living in close geographical proximity are they more similar than um, uh, the groups that are uh, socially more close socially more affine so these are the kinds of questions that they asked and uh, essentially uh, they came up with a few conclusions so for example one conclusion was that re, uh, the, if if you have a re, uh, social group and this if the social group is living in two different places you would find these social groups to have become different over a period of time so there are regional differences within a social group similarly if you have two different social groups belonging to uh, different layers of the social hierarchy living in proximity they become biologically very similar this is understandable because then there is some amount of admixture among these groups etc because of the geographical proximity and therefore they become biologically very similar after a number of generations because of this demonstration of uh, regional differences within a social group if you thought about uh, a, a social construct or a social context like the brahmins of bengal uh, they would uh, not be the same this is not a homogeneous group if you take uh, brahmins living in one part of bengal and compare them with brahmins living in another part of bengal they would be more dissimilar than two different social groups a brahmin group and a kaista group for example living in the same geographical area so that's the reason this is the, this is the uh, quote from uh, the report of the bengal anthropometry survey this shows that a term like brahmins of bengal has to be used with some caution because of these regional differences so those are the kinds of um uh, questions they asked and those are the kinds of answers they got um uh, and and then uh, i i just mentioned this uh, that you know sometimes there is closer resemblance uh, between caste groups within a district than between individuals of the same caste group belonging to different districts so again uh, uh, you know social so they what they are trying to do is to make a contrast between uh, social uh, similarity versus geographical proximity and uh, how that pans out In, in terms of biological proximity as well, or biological similarity uh, as well. So uh, at the end, uh, he was quite uh, dissatisfied. Malonobis was quite dissatisfied. He essentially said that anthropometry cannot tell the tale. We have to supplement by other physical, genetic, and serological data. Uh, human genetics, and I'm very proud to say that, uh, I, and I know that this will not be contested at all. There are other statements of mine that maybe. Uh, other statements of mine that I will make that may be contested, but this statement will not be contested. That serological surveys or thinking about human genetics started from the Indian Statistical Institute, a very odd place for such kind of thinking to start. The reason being, genetics is one of the most quantitative and model-based sciences in biology, and that's essentially the reason why all of this started uh, from the Indian Statistical Institute. So Malonobe set up a, a serologic unit. in isi the anthropometry unit was already set up then we had a serological studies unit and from there slowly we graduate to human genetics unit at the indian statistical institute uh, a human genetics unit that sort of i founded and uh, and uh, headed for a very long time at the isi uh, so he he recognized this that it cannot uh, uh, alone cannot tell the tale and i don't have the opportunity right now to tell you or describe to you why he made this statement but essentially he was uh, dissatisfied because environment was playing a major role on these physical uh, characters physical measurements and therefore he was not able to sort of lay his hands on the basic intrinsic biological differences which is what he wanted to get at all right so um i will cut a very long story short after serological studies unit was established there was another school that came up in bombay in the tata memorial center headed by ld sangvi ld sangvi did his phd from uh, university of chicago uh, again there is a measure that uh, genetic distance measure the first genetic distance measure was by carl pearson the second genetic distance measure was by ld sangvi who was at that time uh, who did his phd um, uh, from the university of chicago and in 1960 and then came back and joined the tata memorial center and again started doing these population kinds of work but this time uh, more more genetic and not anthropometry even though they combine both anthropometry and genetics so a lot uh, many years have elapsed uh, um, so the at the isi the serological studies unit was set up in 1960 or 
um, Sangvi came back and set up this uh, serology group in, um, in, in Tata Memorial Center around 65. And so uh, a, a large number of studies happened during that period. And I'm now uh, into the 2000s. So this is one, and, and the whole idea was to reconstruct human population um, history, uh, particularly human population history in India, and uh, Laji Singh and his collaborators played a major role. And this was one, one paper that I would um, highlight, or actually I'll highlight two papers, but this is one paper that I would like to highlight that led to a model, uh, ancestral model of the people of India. So essentially, they sampled a large number of groups from India, from a um, large number of uh, socially distinct groups from geographical space in India. And uh, the first thing that they identified is that the North Indian groups and the South Indian groups uh, were ancestrally different. Could they identify the ancestral groups with one of the um, you know, uh, uh, prevailing groups? They could not, but uh, they essentially said that what, wherever the ancestral groups of North India were, they called them as North, uh, ancestral North Indians, and uh, the uh, Southern Indians were derived from an ancestral Southern Indian group that they were not able to identify with any of the prevailing groups, any of the extant groups of India, the ones that are uh, that still remain. And of course, they found a large number of, um, you know, sort of, uh, I don't want to use the word hybrid, but admixed group between the ancestral North Indian and the ancestral South Indian. So this was their model. Uh, that there were two ancestral populations that came into India, gave rise to the, um, the, their descendants were, um, um, you know, uh, some of their descendants were in the north, some of the descendants were in the south, and then over a period of time they admixed, and there was a, a, there are a large number of admixed Indian groups as well. Uh, we were also doing similar kinds of studies at that time using a larger repertoire of uh, genetic markers, um, thousands of genetic markers at this time. And uh, so what we, uh, our study showed, and this is uh, slightly contrasted from the inferences or slightly more insightful, more deep, uh, primarily because we, we had sampled uh, many more populations from much wider geographical regions of India. For example, in the previous study that Laji Singh and David Rish and others had done, uh, Sangharaj, uh, they, had not, they did not have any groups of Northeast India. Uh, and Northeast India, as most of us know, those, those of us who have traveled to that region, even, uh, you know, visually, Northeast Indian populations are so different. So it was, uh, we had expected that there would be an ancestry that we would find in North, Northeast of India, even though numerically the total number of people are small in Northeast India compared to Northern and Southern India, yet we would be able to find uh, yet another um, ancestry. And as you know that uh, in India, uh, North India is essentially characterized by what's called Indo-European languages. South India is what's characterized by Dravidian languages. The northeastern parts of India are uh, people there speak languages that be belong to the Tibeto-Burman family. And then there are a fragmented uh, tribal population groups in West Bengal, Bihar, Orissa, that region. Uh, they are called Austric speakers or Austro-Asiatic speakers. So there were these four, uh, uh, you know, language speaking groups, and uh, they sort of correlate very well with the geographical groups, uh, geographical their geographical habitat. And so we took these linguistic groups and tried to find out whether uh, the ancestral North Indians were the same as or could be uh, identified with the Indo-European speakers. So that was our uh, kind of approach to this. And let me explain this. Uh, particular graph. Uh, this particular graph has lots of dots on the x-axis. Uh, and the x-axis is each dot represents an individual. On the y-axis, it varies between 0 and 1. It's not marked, but it varies between 0 and 1. And these four different colors that you see are uh, the four ancestral components that we identify. And if you take one particular dot and look up, so uh, or, or let's take one dot and look up here, so this individual has some amount of one ancestry, some amount of a smaller amount of the other ancestry, a little larger amount of this ancestry, and a very large amount of this ancestry. So that's uh, essentially looking at the genome and asking what fraction of the genome comes from which particular ancestral population, even though we may not be able to identify the ancestral population. This is a very statistical en enterprise. It's a, it's a doable enterprise. It's a statistical enterprise. It's again, this, this enterprise is not just used for human genetic studies. 
Shubir and I have discussed this. These are also useful for various other, uh, you know, the, the kind of work that you do, other animals. They are all applicable to other animals as well. And I uh, would, would uh, you know, after a certain period of time, after this indigo uh, data uh, are generated from a larger number of uh, different kind of uh, animal species, we should do this kind of analysis to find out what, whether there are uh, ancestral populations in the various fragmented animal groups that we see based on uh, the genomic data of which are generated using indigo. Um, okay, so if you look at this, there are four different colors and these four different colors we were able to identify with four uh, language speaking groups, Indo-European, Dravidian, so no, ancestral North Indians, ancestral South Indians, and we were also able to identify two other ancestral components in um, the Indian human population group. Our study was officially um, proceeding to the US National Academy of Sciences. Uh, so this is this is where you know we complemented each other, Laji's uh, efforts and our efforts complemented each other. Then again, we, uh, uh, we, we were talking and we were asking very similar kinds of questions. So they published uh, this, this particular paper, The Promise of Discovering Population-Specific Disease-Associated Genes in South India. So the question that we're asking is that now we see that there is so much of population diversity, how does this pan out in terms of uh, disease-associated genes? Uh, is it possible that certain groups will have higher prevalence of certain diseases and therefore, high prevalence of genes that predispose to that kind of disease. So those are the kinds of questions that were being asked. Or uh, uh, if, you, if you provide, if you treat populations of different um, individuals of different populations with the same kind of drug, will they respond similarly or will there be adverse re reactions uh, of these drugs in some populations but not in the other? So this whole area is called pharmacogenomics. So those are the kinds of questions that we are looking at now that because of the kind of diversity that we established that there is in India, different kinds of ancestral uh, histories of these different populations, et cetera. So that's the kind of uh, question they asked and they were indeed able to find um, that one particular kind of, and I'm only giving you one example, one particular kind of drug that's used for um, uh, during surgery, uh, such that this, the, pop, the, the individual does not feel the pain of surgery. So they use these relaxants and some people show very adverse. They don't even respond to this particular muscle relaxant. And those individuals come from a particular population group, group called Weissias. And this is genetic. Their response to this drug is genetic. And Weissia populations don't have the appropriate genes that, that enable response to this particular drug. This is just one example. They're, they're, uh, uh, this is a main example that they gave in that paper in Nature Genetics. We were also asking very similar kinds of questions, and we published a paper in Nature that uh, had to do with genomes from Asia, and we collaborated with many, many other people. But anyway, uh, we had a very large number of population groups. So these are names of population groups. You don't have to read them. Uh, these are the red portion are the populations. These are the populations that come from India, and those are populations that come from other parts of India, for other parts of Asia, such as SCA is Southeast Asia, etc. Um, uh, I just want to point out two features here. Uh, if you look at Crocodile, well, that is an antiplatelet uh, medicine. It helps prevent blood clots. Um, and uh, as the, the title of the title of our paper in this nature uh, mm, issue is the Genetic Genome Asia 100K Project. Um, enables genetic discoveries in uh, uh, genetic discoveries across Asia. That's the title of our paper. So, anyways, uh, this is this is one particular uh, group that has only about sixty percent response to this drug called clopidogrel, which is an antiplatelet. It prevents uh, blood clots, and that's a population called Lodha, which uh, which which uh, resides in Bengal Orissa border. That's that's where the Lodha resides. And they don't, they don't uh, uh, show a great response to this particular drug. Uh, if you look at, if I take another example, uh, pegintiferon alpha. Uh, pegintiferon alpha is used for treatment of chronic hepatitis B and C and, uh, and, and other vi viral infections of the liver. And, and uh, essentially what you see is that this is a population called Onges in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Uh, and that population is, uh, will never respond to uh, interferon, uh, peg interferon alpha because they don't have that response kind of genes. So here we are trying to bridge 
the gap the, or understanding of genomic diversity among populations of India to medical conditions or uh, treatment conditions and see how we can relate these. And uh, essentially, this happens because of certain um, uh, particular characteristics of how we assemble ourselves into groups. And that's because of what's called a founder effect. Uh, oftentimes, there's a large group. One set of people will move away. Set of people or animals will move away and form a new colony. And that colony will now become bigger. But when the small group of individuals move away from the major big group, they only carry a small repertoire of genes, small representation of genes of this large population group. And then when this expands, there is no new gene infusion. So this small set of genes that they have brought in will only expand until there is admixture from other populations. But if they remain isolated, that's called a founder effect. And essentially, that's the reason why these kinds of differences happen, that some populations are more vulnerable to certain kinds of diseases, some populations respond differently uh, to treatments for a disease, etc. All right. So uh, I'm going to uh, take a pause and move away from what I described in terms of population structure and do two things. Number one, um, uh, talk, talk a little bit about how I got into touch with, uh, with Lalji. Uh, when I came back from the US, Lalji was already uh, doing a lot of work on, on um, DNA fingerprinting. And in terms of DNA fingerprinting, he had his own probe called the, uh, you know, BKM probe, or he uh, isolated this probe from banded crate. So it's called banded crate monitor probe. It had a number, I forget the number now, but anyway, he used that probe for uh, DNA fingerprinting. Um, at that time, you know, when some new concept comes up, uh, the world is uh, contributing to that concept. So this. Uh, it's not confined to one geographical region. Everybody is thinking about the same problem. Everybody is trying to grapple with, uh, you know, different kinds of methods that are being proposed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So at that time, in addition to DNA fingerprinting, there was also another class of problems that were uh, DNA fingerprinting was used for identification, etc. But there was also another uh, class of problems that were being tackled at that time, which had to do with forensics: who murders whom. If there is a paternity dispute, who is the father, and so on and so forth. So those forensic problems were also being used using genetics, uh, tools of genetics. So um, uh, like, like uh, Bapadita said and like others have said, uh, Lali is really the father of uh, DNA fingerprinting in India, and there can be no dispute about this. There was nobody who has contributed, thought about, and contributed to ushering in DNA fingerprinting in India as much as Lalji did. And therefore, there is no dispute over the fact that um, he is the father of DNA fingerprinting in India. There's also no dispute over the fact that he's the founder of the Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics. There was a little bit of an administrative problem. He was an officer on special duty uh, when the Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics was formed by Department of Biotechnology. But then he chose to remain at CCMB and remain as a director of CCMB as opposed to move to a Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics. And Saeed Hasnain was chosen as the director. So I really cannot recall, maybe Shubhi would know or Professor Sharma would know whether uh, Lalji was ever a director of uh, CDFD. He was probably always a, a, an officer on special duty, but I may be wrong. I may be wrong on this. I can't recall very clearly. But there is no doubt about this fact then, and I have been a witness to this, when DBT was thinking about the Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics, it was Lalji who mooted the idea and formed all of the you know, documents that were required in order to establish uh, this institute uh, or this center called uh, CDFD, and he was the founder. Um, so again, like I said that, uh, uh, well, no, I didn't say this, and nobody actually has said this, that uh, after he graduated uh, from BHU, he went to England and, uh, you know, uh, did a lot of work in England, studied in England. Also, at some point of time, had worked for a short period of time with Sir Alec Jeffries, who is the father of DNA fingerprinting. If Lalji is the father of DNA fingerprinting in India, Alec Jeffries is the father of DNA fingerprinting. So uh, uh, Lalji actually got his, uh, got his training in DNA fingerprinting from uh, Alec Jeffries. And uh, so uh, in uh, 19... Again, my memory fails me. It may have been 1994, may have been 1995. Uh, Lalji organized a major 
uh, DNA fingerprinting conference in India. That's where I met um, Alec Jeffries. Earlier, I had worked on DNA uh, using genetic markers for uh, forensic problems, and I had met uh, the head of uh, DNA fingerprinting or this, this kind of work in the FBI called Bruce Budoli. So Bruce had come over, uh, Sir Alec had come over. So it was a galaxy of people that uh, Lalji invited, and that was really a major uh, um, conference in India, 1994 or 1995. Like I said, I used to work at that point. I had already started working at that point of time uh, on, on these forensic kinds of problems. This is paternity dispute. Um, a woman claims that this man is the father of my child. The father denies, no, I'm not the father of your uh, child and so on. So it goes, goes to court and then we start using genetic markers in order to identify uh, paternity. And it's not, it's not something that, uh, that's easily done. There's a lot of probability calculations that you need to make, and you can only assign a uh, probability of that particular man that the woman has accused to be the father, that particular man to be the father of the child. So anyway, uh, so I, was, I had already, uh, I already had this kind of interest, and I remember I gave a talk uh, in uh, CCMB uh, you know, at the time when uh, Lalji was also thinking about these kinds of problems and trying to coalesce uh, in his own mind and in the nation, uh, DNA fingerprinting activities. Uh, he knew of my interest and he had invited me to this meeting. And I uh, actually had made a contribution to this meeting. And I, this, this is again, my interest was primarily forensic identification and there were lots of statistical issues there. And let me just give you a glimpse of the statistical issues there. Um, essentially, you observe these fragment lengths, right? I mean, you uh, use DNA fingerprinting, you, use, you look at the, uh, and run it on a gel. At that time, this is what we, the technology used to be. You put the DNA in the well, run it, uh, cathode and, uh, you know, against positive and negative charge, and then it moves and it forms bands. <coughs> and you measure these fragment lengths. There is some amount of error associated with the measurement of fragment length. So you have um, the, scene of crimes, a crime has been committed, you collected a blood sample from the scene of crime, and you have done a, a fingerprinting assay on that sample. And then you have somebody who has been accused and you have a sample from that individual, let's say a murder. Uh, so you have a sample from that individual and you've also a fragment length distribution from that individual. Both of these measurements have fragment length measurements have some, some amount of error. So what used to be done, and these are the major agencies at that time, life codes, cell mark, I don't know whether life codes and cell mark uh, are still in business. They are private companies that were in business at that time and the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation in the US. These were the three major players and the, what they were doing was to provide confidence intervals. So you could only uh, you know, say with 80% uh, success whether or not the accused was really the perpetrator of the crime. Um, what I did was because of these kinds of errors associated with fragment lengths, I said that let's not use confidence intervals, but use confidence ellipses that enables a better uh, estimation of the probability that the perpetrator, that the accused is the perpetrator of the crime. And I showed that uh, it helps in a major way. So this, that was my contribution to DNA fingerprinting in that particular uh, conference. So after that, I worked a little bit of DNA fingerprinting, but my heart was in disease genetics and not really in DNA fingerprinting. But these are interesting things that happen, um, interesting challenges that happen uh, as you're uh, you know, progressing or as you're moving into your career or trying to develop your career. So sometimes as an aside, these interesting things happen and DNA fingerprinting, at least for me, was as an aside. This, this, this was, and after that, of course, Lalji also uh, continued to do a lot of DNA fingerprinting he solved a number of uh, cases, major, uh, you know, national cases such as the Rajiv Gandhi um, uh, murder case and so on and so forth using fingerprinting technologies. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes. Uh, so I have two parts and I don't know. Uh, I'm going to tell you the first part of my story. And this is, this is my foray into biomedical genomics, uh, talking about uh, two sets of diseases, one to do with the liver and the other to do with uh, cancers. But again, uh, I may or may not at all touch cancers, and I'll take a pause and ask you whether um, I've indulged too much on your patients, and in which case I can just cut out the cancer and stop with uh, one example. All right, 
So we are looking at uh, liver and we are looking at liver enzymes such as bilirubin and bilirubin is usually conjugated. The substrate is conjugated and then it's flushed out. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But when it is in the unconjugated form, it creates a, a, it becomes toxic, toxic to the individual in whom there is a, an elevation of unconjugated bilirubin and they suffer. They suffer from jaundice, for example. In some individuals, they suffer from a very low level jaundice all the time throughout their lives. Sometimes the jaundice picks up, eyes get yellow, they have, they lose their, uh, you know, work days and so on. They're lying on bed. Uh, and then again, they recover and uh, sort of automatically recover without any medication and then again go about doing their life chores. So it's like episodic. And these individuals are chronic. They uh, have uh, low levels of unconjugated bilirubin throughout their life. So we, we were interested in these kinds of people who uh, lose work days episodically throughout their uh, entire life, but are really not life threatening. Um, if you look at catabolism of hemoglobin, so essentially bilirubin is uh, a product of hemoglobin. Um, it is in a water insoluble form. It gets into the liver still in a water, uh, still in a water into, uh, insoluble form. Uh, it's still in unconjugated and it is still in, uh, water insoluble and then becomes conjugated uh, through the action of a particular enzyme. And this is uh, then uh, once it becomes uh, uh, water insoluble, then it's, uh, it's essentially flushed out. Uh, if there is a problem here, uh, then uh, this conjugation does not take place and there is buildup of this unconjugated form of this bilirubin and that's what creates jaundice. There are multiple uh, kinds of uh, jaundice, and you may or may not have heard about these. This uh, level of uh, unconjugated bilirubin is really dangerous, and those individuals are called Krigman-Alger syndrome. Uh, those those individuals have severe, uh, profound jaundice, and uh, but again, they don't survive very long because of the level of jaundice that they have. Uh, this is type one, and type two is between ten and twenty milligrams per deciliter. Uh, unconjugated bilirubin levels are quite high, but not as high as this, and therefore they also have profound jaundice, but are able to survive longer. The individuals who survive and have this episodic um, uh, clinical jaundice are these individuals called uh, this particular syndrome called Gilbert syndrome. Um, Gilbert syndrome was um, identified by a French uh, physician. These individuals uh, have very mild jaundice during illnesses, but usually they have low levels of unconjugated bilirubin all through their life. Uh, we were interested in uh, identifying primarily Gilbert syndrome, but we also identified, um, you know, actually uh, the others were already identified and we took, uh, the, um, you know, the, the cues from there in order to sort out what may have may be happening in Gilbert syndrome. Um, so like I said that uh, this, this is, the, uh, these enzymes, the UGTs are in the, responsible for elimination of the substrate and they convert the water insoluble form to a water soluble form such that it is excreted uh, through the crick, through the kidneys. Um, UGT1, which is, uh, and, and there are multiple uh, isoforms of UGT1. It's a class of genes and, uh, well, it's a, a set of genes, um, of, no, it's a set of exons. It's one gene with multiple uh, isoforms, but it's a set of exons and in these, uh, in each of these isoforms, there are two, uh, three exons, two, four, and five that are con two, three, four, and five that are constant. And it's exon one that's variable that gives rise to the specificity of the isoforms. And these uh, isoforms work in specific tissues. So there are multiple uh, copies of this exon one, and depending on which particular copy combines with uh, exons two, three, four, and five, you get a particular kind of isoform. And these isoforms, uh, well, they are they are uh, present in different tissues of the body. Uh, we focus on UGT one A one because that's uh, the one that's uh, that that's the only isoform that preferentially binds to the substrate bilirubin. Uh, it's it's expressed in the liver, so it's a liver specific enzyme. It's concentrated in the hepatic endoplasmic reticulum, uh, and it catalyzes the reaction of uh, you know con converting it to uh, water insoluble water soluble form. So the UGT1, A1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are constant exons. And this is the exon that provides specificity of this particular isoform. There are multiple genomic alterations there. And these are uh, single nucleotide changes.
or a non-synonymous changes, amino acid altering changes. And then there is a promoter, and there's a, in the promoter, you have a Tata box that regulates. The Tata box has a, a TA insertion, uh, norm, and I'll tell you what, what is the normal and when there is a TA insertion, what happens. Upstream to the promoter also, there are other kinds of um, uh, mutations or polymorphisms that are known. Um, so in the UGT promoter, uh, it's a Tata box. The Tata box has of the UGT1 uh, A1 promoter, the Tata box normally has six repeats. There are some individuals who have seven repeats. And when they have seven repeats, you get uh, individuals with Gilbert syndrome. So the Gilbert syndrome individuals are characterized by seven repeats in the, uh, in the, in the promoter. And here is, uh, here is a, uh, you know, six, home, uh, this is a uh, seven homozygote, and this is a six homozygote, and this is a uh, six, seven heterozygote. And as you can uh, realize that these are uh, standard sequencing, um, uh, is done using standard sequencing. All right, so we did a study of roughly 100 cases and 100 controls, uh, 100 cases of this chronic un unconjugated Bilderman uh, individuals and about 100 uh, normal individuals. And what we were able to find is that, uh, like uh, the uh, like I just mentioned, that when there is this TA insertion in the UGT1 A1 promoter, you get this chronic, uh, um, you know, elevation of uh, bilirubin levels, unconjugated bilirubin levels. But there are also 11% of the TA7 homozygotes, homozygotes with uh, that extra insertion of the TA who have normal bilirubin levels, and we were wondering how these individuals got normal bilirubin levels. So we uh, looked at uh, the, the same promoter and we found that there was a, in the promoter, there is also another uh, sequence, CAT triplet, uh, which also is, can be variable. So there is, in some individuals, there in the normal, there is a single copy. In some individuals, there are two copies of this particular insertion. We were wondering what that insertion might do to the individual or what might happen when the individual has uh, two copies of the uh, of the cat insertion, and we uh, identified that in the presence of TA7, when you have a TA insertion, if there is an additional cat insertion, then you, your bilirubin uh, level rises rises up almost two twofold uh, when you uh, do not have an additional copy of the TA. You have an additional copy of the TA, but uh, not an additional copy of the TA. Um, so we we uh, tried to find out what maybe the structural changes that's happening as a result of the CAT insertion, that's where the CAT insertion is. And if you look around this, you do find that there are significant structural changes that you can identify. Uh, th this, is, this is without the CAT insertion, and this is, of course, with the CAT insertion. There are now two copies of the CAT here. There's only one copy of the CAT here. You can already identify visually that there are structural changes. Uh, we wanted to identify what uh, impact would that have on, um, you know, at the uh, cellular level. And so what we did was make uh, three constructs uh, with TA6, which is a normal, with TA7, with one copy of the CAT, not two copies, and a third contra uh, construct where you have an insertion of the TA and an insertion of the CAT, an additional CAT. Uh, and we had this reporter, we had this uh, you know, the basic vector, and we had a um, uh, luciferase uh, reporter. And so what this, these are the results will correlate inversely with bilirubin levels. And so this is uh, the normal, uh, the lowest bilirubin levels. In this particular case, this is homozygous uh, without the CAT, without the additional CAT insertion. And this is the homozygous CA7 with the uh, um, CAT insertion. And as you can see that uh, there are significant differences in bilirubin levels. This is luciferase reporting, but it's inversely proportional to um, the bilirubin levels. And we published this. Uh, we uh, then also were in, found that there were uh, multiple, uh, multiple, um, you know, in the same cluster, there were other single nucleotide polymorphisms, and we were wanting to know what those single polymorph, uh, single poly, um, nucleotide polymorphisms do. So we did a genome-wide uh, assay of uh, uh, in a case control um, study, and this is the Manhattan plot. Essentially, if you have uh, above a certain threshold. Uh, these, these dots, each dot representing kind of the relative risk of this individual. I'm paraphrasing, but roughly the relative risk uh, of, of having a particular allele at that, that position. And these, each dot here represents a genomic position that we have assayed. And so if you have a dot that's, and this is the, um, this is the uh, multiple testing corrected p-values, 
So if you have a very small p value, it's uh, strongly associated. It's, uh, essentially, that's what the Manhattan plot uh, provides. And so what you find is that the top two will, of course, as expected, will belong to the UGT um, uh, cluster, UGT1 cluster. Uh, we uh, identified that there are these two dots. One is NUP1. So there are three other dots that are above uh, this, this particular threshold. So there are these two dots belong to UGT1A1, exactly what we expect. These two dots belong to two, two other uh, you know, polymorphic loci. And this, this dot belongs to a region which is not annotated well in the human genome. So we were more interested in what was happening in these two dots, even though this this had a lower probability, but you know this is like fishing in troubled waters because it's a large region and we wouldn't be able to figure out what the um, or easily figure out what what may be the impact of that. So we concentrated on uh, the, the other two dots, and what we essentially found was that uh, this 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 dot uh, this dot belonged to NUP one fifty three, and we were then in, interested in knowing what does any NUP one fifty three uh, gene what does it do. Uh, and, and then we adjusted, uh, then we said that, is it, uh, is it possible that NUP-153 is in linkage disequilibrium with the slips in UGT1A1, which is why it is rising up? Or is it kind of an independent impact, having an independent impact on uh, the bilirubin level? And so what we did was to take the same data, adjust, regress out the impact of UGT1A1, and then do the genome-wide association analysis one more time. And this is what we find that uh, NUP-153 is up there. So it's, it's real. It's not like a, uh, you know, tagging another uh, SNP along with the UGT1A1. This is a real, real SNP and independent effect on the urban levels. And if you, we looked at, there are two alleles, A and G. And if you look at the AA homozygotes, AG heterozygotes, and the GG homozygotes, this is what you find in terms of the urban levels. So there's a huge difference uh, among the three genotypes. We, again, to cut a long story short, we went through other kinds of biological experiments, and we found that uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, NUP-153 essentially belongs to a nuclear pore complex in the eukaryotes, and the pore complex uh, is, is a, allows trans transport of uh, various kinds of molecules um, uh, between the uh, between the cytoplasm and the nucleus, so that that is a uh, transporting channel. And what happens is that once you have a problem in that particular channel, there is buildup of different kinds of molecules. Exactly what happens in hyperbilirubinemia, um, and and uh, we went ahead and published this. So overall, we started with an observation uh, that was unknown, which is this you know cr chronic uh, chronically affect. Uh, individuals with chronically high levels of um, uh, of uh, unconjugated bilirubin, not too high, but it's chronic. And then there is this episodic thing, and we wanted to know the genetics of that. So we went to the genetics of that, and we made two interesting discoveries. One is of this uh, CAT insertion, where we had to do a lot of biology in order to find out what that uh, CAT insertion in the promoter does. Um, and and then uh, also the, the other uh, gene that we identified, uh, uh, which is called NUP-153, which uh, turns out has become an important gene uh, because of its uh, ability to allow for transmission of molecules or uh, you know, moving of molecules from, uh, from the cytoplasm into the new here. Um, I uh, can stop here. Uh, if I've indulged too much on your patients, I, I'm really not tracking myself. So. Or I can talk for another 10 minutes, whatever you prefer. The second 10 minutes is for cancer. All right, so uh, in, the, in the last 10 years or so, I've just concentrated on cancer genomics uh, for various reasons, because cancer genomics provides us with a challenge. Uh, one is that we think that uh, cancer uh, is a disease of the genome, but uh, essentially what we, when we look at transmission, it's only in about 10% of cancer cases that you find you know, um, uh, an ancestor who has also been uh, uh, afflicted with cancer. So it's really not a genetic disease in the sense that it aggregates in families. But there was a lot of uh, uh, reasons for us to believe that it is a de genetic defect in the sense that there are changes in the DNA, and therefore it makes it a genetic disease. Uh, but that those changes are not transmitted from one generation to another, which essentially means that these are changes 
in the tissue where the cancer has happened. So it's a somatic uh, uh, genetic disease. Um, we didn't have, you know, beyond before about 2005, we had no ways of uh, identifying in a systematic way uh, changes in somatic genomes. It's only with the advent of the next generation sequencers that we are now able to study changes in somatic genomes. So immediately, so these questions about cancer uh, were lurking at the back of our minds for a long time, didn't have the technologies, therefore none of us, no, no one in the world actually ventured to systematically uh, look at um, some somatic uh, alterations in cancer. But as soon as these next generation sequences, the massively parallel sequences appeared on the scene, and you know, cancers were one reason why uh, these massively parallel sequences were invented in the first place. That was the push. Um, uh, uh, an international um, consortium was formed. And this international consortium was the third international consortium that was formed in human genetics. The first one was the consortium that gave us the reference uh, the sequence of the human genome, the human genome project. The second one was uh, to identify, you know, in terms of genomes of, of individuals, how much of variation is there. So that was called the HapMap project. That also gave us this whole idea that the human genome comprises of some um, haplotype blocks. Uh, that was a result of that particular uh, consortium. The third consortium that was formed, and this was formed almost uh, um, on the heels of the, of the invention of massively parallel sequences, was the International Cancer Genome Consortium. India did not participate in the first two consortia um, for reasons that I can elaborate later uh, in private, but uh, we decided that uh, we, meaning I took a major bold initiative uh, Dr. Mrs. Uh, Manju Sharma was at, uh, was almost leaving and Dr. Bhan was coming in. And so through Dr. Bhan, we said that India should participate because this is a major genomics project and we have not participated in the previous two human genomics projects. And this is, this is very close to what DBT stands for, which is to understand human disease or uh, human genetic diseases. So Dr. Bhan, uh, again, we went through a whole series of national, international, uh, meetings, etc., because this was big bucks. It's not cheap. It, these kinds of projects don't come cheap. Um, and and uh, in the international community, I was a part of the statistical group to identify what should be the sample size, etc. So we worked this out, uh, and uh, 500 was going to be the minimum. So we had to each each one each participant in the International Cancer Genome Consortium has to come up with data at the end of the day uh, on 500 cancer patients. And that essentially meant like analyzing 1,000 genomes. Why 1,000? Because we are looking at somatic mutations or trying to identify somatic alterations. But if you take uh, DNA from, from a tissue, that will contain both germline mutations and somatic mutations. So how would you sieve out the germline mutations from the pool of germline and somatic mutations? You needed uh, another handle. And that handle came from the blood of the human, which usually will only carry the uh, germline mutations and not the somatic mutations. Or even if it does accumulate some somatic mutations, uh, because the RBCs, uh, the 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 uh, WBCs are not very long lived, and so uh, you lose that uh, those, that rep repertoire of somatic mutations. So, anyways, uh, we needed to from each cancer patient, we needed to uh, do genome sequencing based on DNA isolated from the blood and based on isolate, uh, DNA isolated from the tumor tissue. So 500 DNA samples, 500 patients would mean 1,000 DNA samples. So it was, it was a large amount of money, but we did decide to participate. And we decided to participate with the most uh, frequent cancer type uh, in India, which is oral cancer, oral cancer of a particular type. So like I said, cancer is a disease of the genome. And essentially, uh, like I also said, that uh, only about 10% of, um, of cancers are familiar. The remaining 10%, remaining 90% are non-familiar. If you look at the evolution of the cancer genome, just, just to fix ideas, and I'm going to use a specific phrase, and I want to uh, you know, uh, motivate that phrase. So if you look at a cancer genome, it involves usually multiple mutations. So imagine, if you will, that this is an epithelial layer, and these are cells. These are cells below the layer. Uh, all these cells look exactly the same when one is born with. And over a period of time, these cells, these are somatic cells. They are not participating in the reproductive process. These somatic cells will accumulate mutations. So here are some mutations that have accumulated as life goes on. 
in a baby, the baby is growing and uh, accumulating these mutations. Most of these mutations will be innocuous. We would never know that mutations have taken place, except that there are some mutations which uh, will make us aware that here I am, I've you know, taken place. So there are more mutations, and sometimes these mutations lead to clonal propagation of these cells. But this, but the clones are so small that we are oblivious to them. We don't even get to know them. So that that's one clone that has arisen. This is another mutation that has taken place. The black mutation gave rise to another clone of cells, but really doesn't matter. I mean, it's, uh, the clone is small, and we don't even get to know these clones are happening. All the mutations are happening. The clones are happening in our uh, bodies all the time, and we are we are never. Uh, um, we, we, we are never, we are completely oblivious to them. We don't even get to know them. Uh, so these things happen. So here is another mutation that has taken place on the on the back of another two mutations that were pre-existing. So this red, red mutation arose on the cell which already had a black and uh, yellow mutation. So this red mutation was different from the white, reds, and yellows in the sense that it became a huge clone. It reached the epithelial layer and became a malignant tumor. So while we don't care about these white and black mutations, we do care about these red mutations because this red mutation gave the cell a huge growth advantage in that it became a, a, a malignant tumor. It, it reached the epithelial layer and essentially became a malignant tumor. And so uh, these mutations are what we need to identify, these red mutations. And uh, those red mutations are for, so we want to know uh, you know, what are those genomic alterations, the mutations, genomic alterations that drives the cell to a growth advantage, gives the cell a growth advantage and drives it to becoming a, a malignant tumor. Uh, again, uh, we didn't know how to do this, but uh, this is a prophetic statement that was made in 1986, way before uh, these next generation sequences were uh, born. And uh, essentially it was uh, mentioned by, it, it was an essay, that commentary that was written in science in 1986 by a Nobel laureate, Renato Beto, and he said, if you wish to learn more about cancer, we must concentrate on the cellular genome. Uh, we have two options, either to discover the genes important in malignancy by a piecemeal approach, which is go candidate gene, gene by gene, etc., or sequence the whole genome. And he said it will be far more useful to begin by sequencing the cellular genome. He said this in 1986, but we didn't have the wherewithal. Uh, until about 19, uh, uh, until about uh, 2005 or so. So that's that's when we started doing this, and this is a project that's between NIBMG and uh, APTREC, uh, the research component of the Tata Memorial Center, that's headed by Rajiv Sarin, uh, or used to be headed by Rajiv Sarin, not anymore. Uh, we look at squamous cell uh, carcinoma. Oral cancer is what we look at. It's the eighth most common cancer. There are about uh, 250,000 new cases that arise annually. About two thirds of them uh, arise in uh, developing countries, about 130,000 deaths happen annually. Uh, it's tobacco related, about a third of all tobacco related cancers are associated with cancers of the oral cavity. And it's also associated with the human papilloma virus, which is a causative virus for uh, cervical cancer. So, why are we only looking at the gingivobuccal region and not the entire oral cavity? The reason being that this is also interesting. Uh, and this was one of the major reasons why we undertook uh, in, from India, why we participated in the oral cancer uh, project of the International Cancer Genome Consortium, is if you look at India, in India, most of the cancers belong to the gingival buccal region, which is essentially the whole oral cavity except the tongue. And if you look at the West, it's mostly tongue cancer that happens in the, in the West. And already there were some um, or, uh, institutions that were participating in the West from the US particularly on oral cancer. And we said that if we participate from India, we could actually find what the differences may be, genomic differences that there may be in terms of uh, gingivobuccal regions, cancers of the gingivobuccal re region as opposed to tongue cancers. That's the hazardous combination. We all know alcohol, substance abuse, and caffeine, and so on and so forth. Uh, again, so like I said, that we went and did uh, sequencing at depth, minimum of 38 steps for uh, DNA that was isolated from the tumor tissue, uh, DNA that was isolated from the, um, from, from the blood. And uh, we kind of subtracted one from the other to isolate, uh, to identify somatic mutations. It's not a simple process of uh, um, subtraction as I'm sure that some of you deal with, uh, you know, these next gen sequencing data uh, of other, other, other animals. And you know that it is not uh, 
simple uh, exercise to subtract one list from another list. But anyway, uh, it is again a statistical chore, and we identified that there are 10 genes that drive uh, or, uh, gingival buccal oral cancer, and those are the names of the genes. Some of the genes will be very familiar to you. Uh, for example, P50C is completely familiar. Caspase 8 may be familiar. FAT1 may not be familiar to uh, most of you, but these are the names of the genes. HRAS may be familiar. Uh, what we found was that uh, these genes, unfortunately, are all tumor suppressors. And uh, cancers can happen in by one of two ways. Uh, either it's a, it's a genomic alteration in a tumor suppressor gene. These tumor suppressors are active all the time. And when a mutation inactivates them, then tumors happen. Or a class of genes known as oncogenes, which are sleeping giants all the time. And when the mutation wakes them up, they create these cancers. So one of the two. Uh, usually when you have a, a mutation in, a, in an oncogene, these mutations take place at a specific uh, place, uh, a specific region of the entire gene. When you have a tumor suppressor uh, be being active and made inactive, uh, to produce cancer, then mutations can happen uh, in any place. So mutations in any place can inactivate a gene, but to activate a gene, you need mutation in a specific case. That's the whole idea. And what we found was that for each of these genes, mutations are happening all over uh, the gene. And therefore, we, uh, we uh, postulated that these are uh, tumor suppressors that are driving. Uh, we, we can analyze the data more deeply uh, in addition to uh, those significant uh, drivers, we can also find other kinds of genes that are mutated in a smaller fraction, non-significant fraction, yet important. Um, so uh, we, uh, we looked at, uh, again, we uh, looked at the comprehensive characterization of head and neck, essentially from the West, oral cancer from the West, and we looked at uh, our, our, our own data. And what you see is that this is, uh, this is uh, from our own data, and this is from head and neck, the Cancer Genome Atlas data. And essentially what we find is that there are mutations in these genes, one, two, three, four genes. So for example, in HRAS gene, 10% of our cancer oral cancer, gingival buccal oral cancer patients would have mutation in that, that, that gene, and none of the tongue cancer patients would have mutations in that gene. So we were able to identify four genes that are uh, specific, mutations in which are specific to the gingival buccal region. And therefore, uh, if you had a treatment for the general um, HNSCC in the West, those would not uh, provide treatment for ginger buccal uh, oral cancers uh, in our country. And therefore, we, needed to, we need to do something specific that are specific, some kind of treatment that are specific to act on uh, mutations in these specific genes. So that's, that's essentially what I've been doing in the last uh, several uh, years, last decade or so. Um, we also are asking for things like asking questions like, uh, what are the genes that are involved in recurrence? As many of, many of you may know, you treat a cancer type and then again the cancer records. So there is recurrence. Then there is uh, differences in survival. You treat a patient, uh, some patients survive for long, some patients don't. And are there genomic underpinnings to each of these phenomena like recurrence, survival, et cetera? So we've been investigating those. I uh, don't want to, uh, uh, you know, don't have the time and uh, don't want to indulge and pinch more on your patients. Uh, you you have borne me, uh, borne with me for a long time. Uh, again, I uh, wish to end my talk by remembering um, uh, Lalji Singh, uh, again, a father of DNA fingerprinting in India and uh, an institution builder and a bright mind and a very friendly person. I um, really did not ever realize that I would have to stand before you or stand before any audience and give a lecture in memory of Lalji Singh. We were so, so good friends and uh, like I said, he was a few years uh, uh, senior to be, but not so many years that I could imagine that I have to give a memorial talk uh, for him. Uh, again, thank you very much for inviting me here, and I'm uh, really uh, grateful for this opportunity. And uh, thank you very much for coming to my talk. Thank you so much, Seth, for really wonderful talk. I am pretty sure that. All of us in this room have really enjoyed every speech of it and the scientific excuse that you have spread today. I am pretty sure that everybody will take a lesson from it and uh, it will help them help all of us in our home scientific journey. Thank you.
So now, uh, if you permit, we'll take some questions from the audience. I'm happy. <laughs> it's been a very long time. So, if you have, oh, I see. Yes, I. <clears throat> So uh, next time you're in Calcutta, come and visit our lab. So we have now two single cell sequencers. Well, you don't sequence, you need use the same sequencer, but to dissociate the cells, you need these boxes are called yeah, dissociators. Now we've yeah, we've our first paper in um, on single cell in ginger buccal cancer uh, right now is on my laptop and I'm correcting that. So it started. It has started. The other thing is that there are two aspects of it. One is that we set an advanced section in our country. And if we are improved, now we can really find out very quickly. Earlier people were doing but there was space of disturbing making in our SMT. And it's with a disease. But now, very quickly, this is coming up. So, are there a group of people, or because you go to several higher uh, committees, or a bunch of people who also think of treating? Although it's very difficult, we do not say that it cannot be difficult to treat. Ethics is often involved. But for example, now there are a lot of ways and means to. Uh, Minimal invasive transfer means in the liver, and since liver cells are dividing, the chances of permanent integration of good genes or unmutated genes, they will produce the enzymes. For example, the promoter and loop one, which is A, which is the other one. You really, if not 100%, but partially correct the disease, so that individual doesn't suffer. So, are there a group of such scientists coming up or? We think of who will you will give them the food and they can eat with their brain and generate something as a treatment, including uh, the handling of the genome or, or whatever you call that. Uh, yes, uh, the answer to your question is uh, yes. Um, uh, the biggest project that I know that has already uh, been going on in India for maybe three years now. Uh, is anchored in the NCBS, and that has to do with sickle cell anemia. Uh, sickle cell anemia is a purely genetic disease. It's a single uh, nucleotide chain that leads to an amino acid chain, and uh, uh, it has it, uh, impacts on a large number of lives in India. Uh, people who are homozygous for that particular mutation, they don't survive for long, but now they have started to survive because of better management, but not treatment. So NCBS together with Japan, um, Japan has a major interest. They are, uh, you know, trying to find a treatment for sickle cell uh, disease. In terms of other uh, kinds of treatments, like you correctly pointed out, there are ethical issues. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is one way to, uh, you know, uh, do these kinds of corrections, but that has to be tested. In right now, it's all cell line work that's being done. But uh, my hope is that one day. Uh, it's not being done anywhere in the world uh, right now because of these ethical issues, ethical challenges, except that we had heard about one case in China, uh, but that came under big fire. Uh, so anyway, uh, the answer to your question is there is thinking. CRISPR-Cas9 for treatment uh, of human diseases is being done right now at the um, cell biology, cell line level, but not really at the organismal level. I might also add, with respect to your single cell question, I didn't actually uh, spell it out so clearly this morning. Professor Sharma and I, we were uh, discussing about embryogenesis and two cell stage, etc., with genes that express. Uh, there, I would imagine that single cell would be a, a technology that would be of extreme interest because, you know, from a two cell, uh, from two cells, you can't isolate enough DNA to be able to sequence or, or, or enough RNA to be able to do RNA sequencing to look at uh, single cell, to look at um, expression, uh, gene expression or mRNA expression. But if you, uh, you know, engaged in single cell technologies, you should be able to do that. For right now, 10x, yes. But we are go soon going to move out to high. Uh, good morning, sir. It was a very nice job. Oh, thank uh, you. I have a question. So, like, as many more projects have been completed about more than 20 years ago, 
So, uh, when can we understand the uh, relationship and qualities between genes, proteins, and metabolites together in the human? So, as we, uh, as these three are both uh, interlinked with each other. So, metabolites, I don't know, but genes and proteins, there's this encode project uh, that has actually annotated at the protein level what goes on. In, uh, when there are alterations at the genomic level. So the ENCODE project already has a huge database from where we uh, sieve out such data, but uh, it does not have metabolites. Metabolites, first of all, the technology of detection of metabolites is just coming up. It's still not stable like here. I don't work on metabolites, but I hear that the technologies are still not stable. So until it uh, reaches a, a little bit of stability, it's very difficult to indulge, uh, engage in a project. Because after all, if your uh, results are not perfect, then how can you relate? So I think metabolites will still take some time. And uh, but uh, yeah, there are already projects that are ongoing for more than ten years. The Encode project has started more than ten years ago, and they have uh, in the online databases which we use uh, for for various kinds of purposes. Yeah. So Encode is an encyclopedia of DNA elements. And uh, it has uh, these kinds of, yeah. So, the wonderful talk again, I have a question. I was very interested when you talked about the on population of Andaman Nicobarani. So, responding definitely to that one. So, uh, during the Wuhan China infection, when the COVID 19, the first uh, outbreak in pandemic, we started, there are a lot of uh, talks about uh, how different populations were reacting differently to the virus. Uh, for example, in India, we were talking about 1% of the death rate or even lesser than that, while all the Western population are talking about 10% death rate. So, retrospectively, has there been any study which has named the, uh, the human population that comes to uh, this particular Wuhan strain infection? So, again, if, uh, uh, I will be forced to say some things that I did not want to say from here because it's very controversial. There are already papers in Nature and Science that show that we have underestimated deaths. Yeah, 1% versus 10% that you just talked about. Uh, Prabhat Jha from Canada has led a major WHO study that has been published. The government does not agree, right? So I really honestly don't want to get into this uh, death rate. But in terms of infection, most of us thought that Dharavi slum would be wiped out. But the amount of uh, infection that there was in that slum area was minimal, of course, because uh, you know people had anticipated that there would be a huge uh, impact of this infection. Uh, there was also much greater management of uh, Harabi slum compared to, for example, the city of Hyderabad. Uh, whether or not that management itself was good enough to contain the spread of infection, or whether prior infection with other kinds of um, you know. Uh, pathogens kept their immune system high is a is a question that at that time could not be answered because nobody could go and sample them but it's, people are starting to answer now or question and um, writing projects in order to get that those kinds of answers now um, so we uh, don't have uh, i would not be able to say anything on the death rate but infection rate indeed the slums uh, at least the dharavi slum uh, in mumbai actually registered a very low rate of uh, infection. Why that could be so, one never knows. And the uh, dominant hypothesis is that pre-existing uh, immunological boosting as a result of um, uh, they're their being exposed to other kinds of infections. But again, this needs to be proven. It's still a hypothesis. Thank you. One more question I have about the uh, fact uh, sequence the uh, <laughs> good question. The problem is that, uh, you know, because I have not been, first of all, I'm not competent to do that, not even a biologist. Uh, I've taught myself biology, and at least I can understand to a certain extent, design some experiments, get some experiments going, but beyond that is uh, beyond me. So I need collaborators. Now I try to seek out collaborators, but most everybody says that, oh, well, Gilbert syndrome, even if it is chronic, people don't die. So I would rather expend my energy in collaboration with, uh, with such diseases uh, that kill people. 
So I actually have not been able to find collaborators who will take these kinds of questions. Well, actually, my question was, you know, that for certain economic problems, you know, in the lab. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, 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 okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I didn't get. Okay. So that's like I I don't know that I haven't thought about it. That's a new thought. Uh, I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Yeah. Compare. Yes. Yes. Uh, it used to be very challenging. Now it's uh, the challenge has come down uh, uh, significantly. Uh, really, the challenge is not to generate data, not even to uh, design an experiment or think of what kind of data must be generated. The challenge is in, in analyzing the vast amount of data that we can generate. So in these people, we have to select. For example, I mean, this is what I could think of: marathon runners in Africa. Uh, we should we should probably sample their muscle tissue and look at expressions of genes at various stages of their lives at various work times. That would probably provide us with enough cues as to which genes get expressed uh, when these people run marathon, uh, you know, uh, marathons as opposed to let's say a white Caucasian who is also running a marathon. Whether the same set of genes get expressed, probably not. So we we can think about design of experiments. What kind of data must we generate in order to answer these questions? But the real challenge right now is to be able to analyze the data. Uh, those methods are still not completely stable. Uh, they are still evolving, uh, and and therefore I think it will uh, you know these kinds of uh, questions where you will get only a very few small number of people. So in view of a small sample size, unless your data analysis becomes completely stable, you will probably not be able to un, uh, you know, isolate uh, or identify proper uh, in, or get proper inferences from, from the data. So I think those questions are extremely interesting and important, but I think one needs to don't 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 put your finger on those kinds of problems. <laughs> I think you'll spend a lot of uh, waste a lot of time not being able to get a proper answer, not because of your fault, but because of the fault of people who are you know devising algorithms to uh, analyze the data. Molecules mean uh, again, uh, like NCRNA, like your 
by the by my army. So they are also actually contributing the expression of the need. Right. So can we focus with uh nutrition or analyze the more nutrition? Will they will they have uh, these these on so let me uh, let me take your first question first. Uh, again, I think since you are in this business of annotating unknown regions of the genome or unknown functions of the uh, genomic regions, uh, the best place for you to go would be to systematically look at the nature of approaches that ENCODE has taken. The ENCODE project has uh, devised a very large number of approaches, much of it using different kinds of cell lines in order to annotate. And uh, cell lines and uh, looking at orthologs of these genes in other uh, animal species where it is known, where it is uh, the function is known. So, again, I'm not the right person to actually give you a recipe of how you uh, need to go about it, but I myself have tried to read some of these uh, encode approaches, and they're very fascinating uh, beyond me, beyond my uh, you know knowledge grasp. But since you are in this business and you are interested. I would uh, really urge upon you to look at these ENCODE uh, approaches and the large number of papers that have been written. There are uh, hundreds of papers that have been written, but you don't have to read all of them. There are some methods papers of the ENCODE, and I think you should concentrate on the methods papers. The second, uh, with respect to you know, pi RNA, long non-coding RNA, et cetera, et cetera, uh, again, it's a matter of priority. Uh, um, obviously, if you can identify a mutation, a uh, mutation that changes an amino acid, it's more likely to have an impact on the protein than another long non-coding RNA, I would imagine. So one needs to prioritize as much as possible from the known kind of you know, genetic phenomena, you can explain to a certain extent, and after that, you cannot explain. When you cannot explain, you obviously have to invoke epigenomes and long non-coding RNAs and all of this, but I, it's a, I think it's a matter of priority. Uh, Mendelian genetics hold to a large extent, and Mendel did not have to invoke, you know, non-non-coding RNAs or, um, uh, you know, these, these kinds of epigenomic, uh, other kinds of epigenomic alterations, etc. Genomes explain, but now we know for complex diseases, genomes don't explain everything. So we need to understand how much uh, the genome explains, the genomic alterations explain, and then you would still find a fraction of cases where uh, you are unable to figure out that from the known genomic information, why has this disease precipitated in this individual? I think there you have to look. Or there is also another approach that one is taking these days. I was talking about um, uh, the quantitative levels of these uh, markers, right, of these bilirubin, et cetera. These are quantitative levels. It's not zero one. Either one has bilirubin or does not have bilirubin. That's not the kind of data that we are dealing with. We are dealing with quantitative levels. And when you look at quantitative levels, the genomic alterations can explain the variation that you see to a certain extent. Then there will be a fragment, fraction of the variation that will not be explained by the genomes. And there probably we need to look at promoters, epigenomic alterations, et cetera. So it's a matter of priority. Nothing is, whatever knowledge that we have gained might impact on the levels of gene expression or the proteins uh, are important, but where would you choose? Would we choose, a, if we have an unknown disease, should we choose uh, pi RNAs to look at the impact of pi RNAs on the disease, or should we look at genomic alterations first? It's a matter of priority. I think everything is important, but one needs to prioritize. Yeah. So that was fantastic, Doctor. So that's the first part. So there is a specific population in India with worried studies when you were talking about that. They, they, are, they were essentially to your proposal, uh, maybe some of these studies which were they did. So uh, how did we got adopted to that? Is it a natural selection or artificial selection of surrounding that area? Do you find any admixture and what is the logic behind that? Is this sensitive also? So it's not one one answer. There is no one answer to this question. Different populations with these different kinds of characteristics, uh, are big, the, the reasons are very different. For example, for the ONGES, with respect to Peggy Japan, I can almost bet my annual salary uh, that it was a founder effect. But with respect to larger populations like the Vaisyas that, that Lalji had found, I don't think it was a founder effect. I think it was a combination of admixture and natural selection. So one needs to just stick to that. You know, there are so many interesting questions to deal with. 
uh, that one doesn't spend a lifetime looking at just one question, but these actually demand a lifetime's work on uh, you know, one particular system, one particular population in order to look at uh, the impact of admixture, natural selection. Natural selection is so difficult to pin down uh, because you're now looking at environment and you don't know what environmental factor might actually impact on response to a drug. So these are these are problems, but they are. Uh, it, it's not. I'm hundred percent certain that the explanation is not uniform. Different populations, even same drug or different drug, will be different explanation. My second question: In your little uh, bit of here, uh, you have talked about mutations with the seven and six. Simultaneously, uh, uh, you are correlating it with loop one fifty three, probably for the nuclear smart code. So are these two are linked? Uh, in complete population, uh, it is uh, linked meaning link. both of them. Link. No, no, they are not. That's the no, no, no. Initial, no, no, they are not. That's the reason why we did the second part of the analysis where we regressed out the effect of UGT one A one because our hypothesis there was exactly what you said. Is it possible that it is some kind of linkage disequilibrium or some pull up of the uh, NUP one fifty three by UGT one A one, which is a major deal? That's the reason why we regressed it out and looked at genome-wide dissociation one more time to find that once you regress out, NUP one fifty three is way up there in terms of their, you know, smallness of their p value. Right. So my final question is: nowadays we see most of these publications, all of them, they're coming back the either in a single cell genomic or single cell transcriptome. So uh, what is the definition basically when you take a somatic cell, uh, is it single cell genomics or transcriptome means, are you really using a single cell, but when we end up uh, reading their protocols and everything, not at all, they're not from a single cell. They are from a single cell. Uh, most of them, they use the I don't know what papers you're reading. They use 20, uh, use 50 cells. No, 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 no. no. It's, it's not from a single lineage. Uh, no, no, well, lineage is a different thing. The transcription signature that we are getting is from a single cell. So you first dissociate, you collect, yeah, and then RNA, and then you dissociate, uh, not RNA, I mean, you uh, collect the cells, you dissociate into single cells. There are protocols for dissociation of single cells, into single cells. Then you pass it through a microfluidic apparatus, and each channel in the microfluidic apparatus will only allow for one cell. Sometimes you, we get doublets. So when we uh, sequence, we, we throw out all of those where you know we have a doublet count, but we then only look at data on single cells. So the 20 cells that you're talking about, this microfluidic apparatus allowed 20 channels, on 20 cells to go through each of these channels. And we have generated data on 20 cells. So that's what it is. And, uh, but the mRNA data that we are generating is from a single cell. It may not be from a single lineage though. Then once we have accumulated, we look at the gene expression levels and try to find out and ask ourselves, are all of these cells from the same lineage? Invariably, the answer is no. Yeah, so, and, and then I can tell you a long story. Uh, right now I'm in the thick of it. Like I said that in my laptop, our first manuscript is right there. So. Uh, yes, uh, in the context of uh, population structure, um, we did study a lot of mitochondrial genomes and uh, one, one attraction of studying mitochondrial genomes was that, uh, you know, we could, since it's uh, essentially one single locus, you can look at multiple, um, multiple polymorphic loci in order to haplotype because it's so we uh, a lot of our original work on population structure etc was based on mitochondrial data but then uh, if you're looking at mitochondrial data is essentially like a single locus and so it's like uh, looking at the abo blood group locus in order to infer for you know population similarities but that's just one locus and there's a lot of noise that creeps in so slowly over a period of time, these mitochondrial DNA uh, studies have actually uh, dissipated. And people, when uh, these chips and other kinds of uh, nuclear DNA uh, assays came about, we all went into that because then you're able to study multiple 
loci at the same same time. So one more question. Uh, the same when we apply to cancer genetics. So uh, is there uh, any maternal inheritance that has the, the same mitochondrial genome? Though there's a somatic cell mutations that we have shown us, but is there any uh, maternal inheritance that has? So are you asking, uh, normally uh, mitochondrial DNA is maternally transmitted, right? There's maternal inheritance, uh, but this is somatic. So there is no transmission per se, right? Yeah. So uh, these are, these are, this is clonal propagation. So it's uh, like the original cell, whatever kind of mitochondria it has, that, that is getting duplicated in some way, duplicated or replicated in some way. A replication, not in the biological sense, but yeah, copying. Uh, but that, that, that particular question is probably not relevant to cancers. We have done mitochondrial DNA assays for oral cancer, essentially to ask the following question, that uh, you know, these cells, as they are uh, making clones, they need a lot of energy, and the energy is supplied by the mitochondrial DNA. So are the mitochondrial DNA uh, molecules in the cancer cells slightly different from the normal cells that you know, divide by binary fission? And we didn't find any uh, convincing evidence for that. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> can you can you take a microphone? That would be useful. Yeah. <clears throat> No, no. Uh, so let me understand this. So if we take a population, we are sampling a small number of individuals, and therefore, is that small number of individuals representative of the entire population? That's always a question. We can never study all individuals in, all, in, in any single population. So it has to be a representative sample. What you call as a representative sample depends on two things, how you're sampling and what your sample size is. So we try to do as much random sampling as possible. The sample size is, for most of us, uh, the sample size is actually uh, limited by the amount of funding that we get from DBT or elsewhere. So that's a, that's a big problem. Uh, again, uh, I have to sit with you separately to be able to explain. I was a part of that three member committee, uh, Eric Landner, myself, and Alcas Price. Uh, so the three of us worked out, all three of us were statisticians. So we worked out, and I can, I can actually uh, sit down as an aside and uh, um, show you how we derived that number 500. It was 400 and something, you know, 459 or something. But then we said 500 is a good number. So, question is like, 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 so or, uh, after a certain number of mutations, even if you keep smoking, it won't get into cancer. Oh, I need to read that paper, and I have not read that paper. Uh, uh, can you can you please send me that? Uh, I'll share my email address with you. Can you send me the DOI or or the title of the paper? I will look at it. No, I have not seen this paper. That that would be of uh, great interest to me. Thank you. Excellent question, thank you. Uh, so, uh, what is your uh, comment on uh, microbiome and uh, its contribution to the diversity? You know, we can see there are many papers that talk about uh, you know, broad connection between the microbiome diversity and the metabolic disorder. So, can we really say no a mutation in particular gene is causing a cancer or it is a, a collective uh, result of? All is all is possible. Uh, uh, microbiome is uh, just now being looked at in the context of cancer. I mean, in the last 
three or four years, people have started uh, to look at the microbiome in the context of cancer. Uh, everything is possible. So obviously, it is not uh, you know one one single phenomenon or one single set of reasons that causes cancer or any disease for that matter. There may be multiple reasons, but there are some proximal reasons and there are some distal reasons. Uh, if you ask me at this stage from one oral cancer paper, oral cancer microbiome paper that has been published, I would say that uh, the genomic alterations are proximal. The microbiome cont contribution is way distal to, to this. But again, this need not be so for all cancer types. For example, we had never imagined that virus could cause cancer, right? And uh, there is only one single cause of cervical cancer in women, which is infection by human papillomavirus. So there are unusual, un, 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 unforeseen kinds of conclusions that are derived. So it's quite possible that for some diseases, for some cancer types, microbiome will become the most dominant cause. I don't know that. But that research has only started recently because we did not have the wherewithal again to be able to uh, look at the microbiome in a systematic way. But now we do have. Yeah, yeah microbiome is also evolving right now. That's, uh... That's even more difficult, right? Anything that changes with time uh, becomes even more difficult to study. So, but that, that doesn't mean one should not study. It only means that you need a lot of energy and a lot of money. Each of these experiments is very expensive. Um, yeah. So, if you if you want to do metagenomic sequencing, that's that's a lot of money. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think genetics. This is uh, one last question, yeah. I think. Genetics and limits and in presence of population always made so much of question. We are unable to stop questions from coming one by one. So this is a kind of a non scientific question. So we mentioned that uh, there are certain communities uh, having some physical patients of genetic disorder. So how do you see the role of human genetics? Uh, uh, how do you see? How do you see the role of human genetics? I would never use that word either in private or in public uh, for the simple reason that human history shows how this word has been hugely manipulated in order to ostracize population. So I, I would not use genomics in order to either ostracize populations or manipulate individuals. So I would not. So I have no answer to your question. I see it in very bad light, if you ask me. We have uh, a lot of discussion. Uh, so, again, uh, sure. Most welcome, Mr. Jamendra. And uh, before pleasure. I go for thanking uh, all the people who have helped to organize this program, I will request uh, Director Madam to hand over our uh, token of appreciation to our distinguished guests today. Thank you very much for Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, it is time to thank. Um, to our director for advising the uh, organizing committee and enabling us to make this event a successful event. And we thank Professor Majumdar to uh, find some time to visit NIAB. Is it the first visit, sir? No, no, sir? No. So we'll always cherish every visit will be. 
uh, cherishable visit. So we thank you again. And we also will be happy to uh, invite you again and again to this campus. And uh, I thank our administration, finance and stores and all other uh, administrative staff for helping in organizing uh, this event. I thank all the participants, all our students, research fellows, and those who attended online uh, for uh, making this event very successful, throwing us so many questions and uh, making the discussion so enjoyable. Thank you all once again. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please, everybody join us for tea and snacks outside. <laughs>